a look at a statement Jesus made when he gave his very famous Sermon on the Mountain. And of all of the things that he said in that sermon, this statement is probably the most well-known. And of all of the things he said, this raises the most questions. Statements found in Matthew 5, verses 38, 39. Would you turn there? Matthew 5, 38, 39. Matthew 5, 38, 39. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. If somebody strikes you on the right cheek, turn to them the other also. Now, anybody who reads this and thinks about it is going to come away with some troubling questions. Does this mean if I see a crime being committed... I do nothing to stop it. If a robber breaks into my house at night, do I not resist him but turn the other cheek and tell him where the good stuff is? Should we do away with the police force? Disband the army? If the blacks of America were following this verse, would they still not be riding in the back of the bus? What are we to make of this? Is this realistic? Practical? Is it even consistent with other things Jesus said and did? I mean, didn't Jesus talk about being the door to the sheepfold and what he had in mind was the shepherd would position himself at the entrance into the sheepfold in order to stop anyone from getting inside and harming the sheep. Didn't he on another occasion take a whip and drive out of the temple? Those he said were turning his father's house of prayer into a place where they were robbing and fleecing the worshipers. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other. What are we to make of this? In order to begin to understand it, let's put it within the flow of his sermon. This is a sermon from a mountain. It actually covers chapters 5, 6, and 7. And in this sermon, Jesus has one dominant truth that he's trying to get across. He has one central point, one key idea. And his key idea is this, that unless our righteousness surpasses the righteousness of the religious leaders of his day, we don't know God. Unless our response to God's word, unless our obedience is greater than their obedience, we are not in his kingdom. That's the key thought, and you find it in verse 20 of chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 20. I tell you, here's his dominant point. I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. Our response to God's word, our obedience, must be greater than theirs or we do not know God. Now to illustrate what he means by our response must be greater than theirs, he goes on to give six examples. He will six times say, you have heard what the scribes and Pharisees teach you about a particular biblical truth or passage of scripture. 
I say to you, they have been superficial in their approach to that passage. They have manipulated it. They have twisted it. They have misinterpreted. They have taken what God said and they have moved it in wrong directions. I say to you, unless your response to God's word, unless your understanding of what the heart of God was after, unless your obedience is greater than theirs, you do not belong to God. You will not enter the kingdom. Six examples, he will say, you have heard that it was said long ago. You know what down through the generations our religious leaders have taught you about a biblical truth. But I say to you, here is what God really intended. Here's what the God, heart of God was after. Here is where your obedience needs to be. Six examples. The first one is in verse 21. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, down through the decades, do not murder. And the religious leaders taught you that as long as you refrain from the physical act, as long as you do not physically take somebody's life, you were okay on this commandment. But I say to you, when God said, do not murder, God was looking at that anger in your heart, which wanted to destroy somebody. And anyone who is angry with his brother is already vulnerable to God's judgment. Whoever looks at somebody and says, I so despise you, I'd just like to wipe you off the face of the earth, has already violated God's intent in that command. The second example is in verse 27. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. And they have taught you that as long as you refrain from the physical act, you have satisfied God's command. But I say to you that when God gave that command, he intended to point you toward a singular, honorable, exclusive sexual focus on only one person for all of your life. And I say to you that if you even begin to imagine what it would be like with someone else, you can kind of wonder, eh, yeah. you have already broken God's heart. Six examples. So when we come to verse 38, we come to the fifth example. For the fifth time, Jesus will say, you have heard what they have taught you in the area of personal relationships. You have heard down through the decades the religious teaching about your connections with each other, and they have told you eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But I say to you, the heart of God is in a different direction. Now, what is it that's going on in here's what they have said and here's what he says God's heart is? Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. That's a biblical phrase, okay? It occurs in the Old Testament several times. Now, it's a phrase God said. So the question is, what did God intend by that phrase? If they are manipulating it, if they are twisting it, if they are misapplying it, then what was it that God originally had in mind how that phrase would operate in our lives? What did God have in mind, eye for eye, tooth for tooth? Let's go back to a couple of the Old Testament passages. Let's see the phrase, and we will discover what God intended. And then we will see how they twisted it or misapplied it. Let's go back to Leviticus 24. Leviticus 24. Leviticus 24. The first thing we'll see is this. When God gave that statement, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, that was the first sign of justice in a savage world. It was, the, it was a merciful law in a barbaric culture. It was a law that said you can only punish someone up to the level they deserve. You cannot go beyond. You can only bring justice to them to the level of the crime that they have committed. You cannot exceed that. You cannot go beyond that. It was a limiting law. It limited excessive 
punishment. Let's look at it. Leviticus 24, beginning in verse 19. If anyone injures his neighbor, whatever he has done must be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he's injured the other, so he is to be injured. Whoever kills an animal makes restitution, but if you put a man to death, whoever kills a man, he is to put to death. You are to have this same fair, just law for the immigrant, the alien, as well as the native citizen. You cannot take advantage of somebody in your society who is without citizenship rights, who is without protection under the law. You cannot take advantage of, of the immigrant who is defenseless. No. You can, the same just law is to be for everyone within your society. You see, in the ancient world, they operated on the same principle that two little boys operate on in the back seat of the car. Okay? One little boy begins to infringe on the space of the other little boy. And the other little boy sees this monstrous violation of his space and and the first boy goes and the second boy goes and there is an escalation of the violence. An escalation beyond the level of the provocation. In the ancient world, if somebody hit you in the mouth, knocked a tooth loose, tooth loose, you waited until they weren't looking, you took a four by four and bam! <laughs> took bridge work to put it back together again. In the ancient world, if somebody from a neighboring tribe came into your tribe and murdered one of your men, the next night you got all the able-bodied warriors in your tribe, you went over and you massacred that entire village. You hear this escalation in the book of Genesis, a man named Lamech, Genesis 4, he brags to his family. He says, listen to me, I have killed a man for wounding me. I've killed a boy for striking me. And into that savage world, God said, you may not do that. You can only punish someone up to the level of what they have done. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, fracture for fracture. You may not go beyond that. And so the first thing we see from the scripture is that God intended this as a merciful, just, limiting law. There's something else we see from it. If you turn to Deuteronomy 19, what God had in mind, Deuteronomy 19, when he gave this commandment. From Deuteronomy 19, we're going to see that God intended this principle to operate in the court system. It was a principle for our judicial dealings, not our one-on-one -on -one relationships. It was for the legal system, not for our private interactions. It was, in, it was to produce justice within a society. It was not to guide us in our one-on-one -on -one behaviors. Notice in Deuteronomy 19 how this entire principle of eye for eye, tooth for tooth, operates within the court system. Verse 16, Deuteronomy 19, verse 16. If a malicious witness takes the stand to accuse a man of a crime, the two men involved in the dispute must stand in the presence of the Lord before the priests and the judges who are in office at the time. The judges will make a thorough investigation. And if the witness proves to be a liar, giving false testimony against his brother, then do to him as he intended to have done to his brother. You must purge the evil from you. The people will hear of this, they'll be afraid, Never again will such an evil thing as perjury occur within your midst. Show no pity. 
eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. A malicious witness brings a false accusation against an innocent man hoping to get some punishment put on him. Bring it into the courts. The judges who are not emotionally involved, who have no stake in it, who, who they, they can be dispassionate, objective. They make an investigation. They look at the evidence. They hear the depositions. They sift it. And if they come to the conclusion, you are a liar. You are a malicious, false accuser trying to get some penalty put on an innocent man. If they come to that conclusion, whatever penalty he wanted to be put on that man, put it on him. If it was something that took 30 stripes, 30 stripes. If it was a capital offense and he was hoping for a death penalty, life for life. And you will teach your people you don't commit perjury and bring false accusation and fear of ever doing that will spread through the nation and you will produce a society where justice occurs. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth was meant to be a principle to guide us in our legal dealings. A principle for public justice as not a principle for private revenge. And that's how the scribes and the Pharisees were treating it. The scribes and the Pharisees were saying, in your personal relationships, in your one-on-one -on -one dealings with each other, it's eye for eye, tooth for tooth, baby. Stand up for your rights. Don't let anybody push you around. Somebody does you dirt, teach them they can't do that and get away with it. Give it back as good as you got. And Jesus says, that's not the heart of God. I say to you, do not resist an evil person. If somebody strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other off. Now, what is Jesus saying instead? Okay? If somebody strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. Let me see if I can illustrate this. Would you help me? Come on. What's your name? John. John? Sean. Sean. Okay. Stand right there, baby. All right. Now you're not going to get mad. Okay. We're going to talk about striking on the right cheek, turning the other one also. Okay? All right. Now put your hands down. They were good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now, I'm a right-handed man. Okay? Most, most men are right-handed. If I'm going to strike Sean on the right cheek, what kind of a blow is that going to have to be? Backhanded. All right, that's good, thanks. <laughs> what kind of a blow is... Huh? Degrading. Degrading. Humiliating. It's not a blow designed to inflict the maximum amount of damage. I mean, that blow would be... Okay? It's a blow of contempt. It's a blow that says what I think of you. It's what we see on the old movies for dueling, you know, one guy pulls off a little white glove. <laughs> it's a blow that says, <clears throat> you see, when Jesus talks about the evil person, he's not talking about random, mindless violence in the society. He's talking about somebody who knows you and somebody who wants to <clears throat> you. If some maniac comes rampaging down the street, trip him. If there's a robber cruising through the neighborhood looking at random for houses to rob, Call the police. That's not the kind of evil Jesus is talking about. The evil he's talking about is somebody who is personally focused, intent on saying to you, and when I think of you. He's talking about the person at work who gets along with everyone else but somehow has it in for you. 
They're willing to cover other people while they take a long lunch hour. They're willing to stay after a half hour to help them finish something up so they can get out in the mail tonight. But when you come and ask them a question about something, it's kind of like, why are you so dense? You're the dumbest person we've ever hired around here. And they, hey, man, what's, what's, okay. Jesus is talking about the neighbor who on July 4th comes, invites everybody over for a backyard barbecue and swim, but doesn't invite you. And it's not like you're the social pariah of the neighborhood. Other people invite you over. When you throw a party, they come to your house. This neighbor will not have you over. Jesus is talking about the relative who gets along with everybody else, and you get along with all the other relatives, but for some reason, this relative always has snide comments to make about you in front of everyone else, and you find that occasionally, they are misrepresenting you to other members of the family, getting you in trouble. Jesus is talking about the times when you and I perceive that the evil is individually focused on us. And he says, when you perceive that someone has slapped you on the right cheek, turn the other one. Do not retaliate, do not resist. Leave yourself open for another instance. Let it occur again. Do nothing to stop a repeating of that event. And our question is, why? Why, Lord? Won't that just let them know they can walk all over me? That I'm a doormat, they can do whatever they want, and there'll never be any, why, Lord? Why should we turn the other cheek? Let's go to Romans chapter 12, where we will conclude. <coughs> Romans chapter 12. Look at me up here. What we are going to see is this, that when God's man or God's woman turns the other cheek, that may be the last link in a series of events which joins them to your God. When God's man or God's woman turns the other cheek, that may be the last link in a series of events going on in that person's life that you do not know about, but that God is working on them. And when you turn the other cheek, when you do not retaliate, but instead just absorb it, that may be the last link which joins them to your God. Let's look at it in Romans 12, beginning in verse 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Instead, be careful to do what is right. Be, be concerned to have the right response in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Don't take revenge. Leave that to God. Leave room for God's wrath to come in. Don't fill it up with your anger. Leave room for God's wrath to come in because God has said, it's my prerogative to avenge. I'm the one who will do it. I will repay. If some kind of punishment or revenge is the appropriate, necessary response to what they've done for you, I'll take care of it. Leave it up to me. Don't you do it. Instead, here is your response. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. What can you do to make life easier for them? What can you do to serve them in some way? Turn the other cheek. Don't strike back. Why? In doing this, you will heap 
burning coals on his head. Somebody says, what? Somebody else says, oh, I get it. If you really want to pay them back, be nice to them. Drives them up a tree. No. No. Paul is lifting a quote out of the book of Proverbs. We won't turn to it because in the Proverbs it just talks about heaping burning coals on someone's head. And in the book of Proverbs, this proverb came from a a ceremony or a ritual that started in Egypt. And because Egypt was close to Palestine, Israel, the proverb came across the border and was used in their country too and came into our book of Proverbs. Now what did it mean to heap burning coals on the head? What was the ceremony or ritual in Egypt? In Egypt, when somebody discovered that they had been wrong about something, maybe the day before they had made a comment about somebody else in the village and today they discovered, oh, I was totally wrong, totally misjudged the person. Or maybe a couple days earlier in a council meeting they had advocated a certain course of action and today they suddenly realized that would have been a disastrous course of action. Okay. They realized they were wrong about something. Okay. Because in the culture there was no way of twittering or t- texting or emailing or putting notices in the newspaper, the only way of publicly disseminating your awareness that you were wrong, and here's the ceremony they developed. They went and they took hot, they took charcoal briquettes, they fired them up, they got hot cold, poured them into a shallow pan like a wok, and with a towel under their head, they heaped up burning coals of fire on their head, and they went and stood in some public square where all the traffic of the village or the town went through, and the symbolism was, my mind has been burned clean, my thoughts have been purified, what I did or said, I now realize I was wrong to heap up burning coals of fire was something an individual did voluntarily to say, I was wrong. When God's man or God's woman turns the other cheek, that may be the last link that joins them to your God. Now, why does it work that way? Why is that happening? What's making that the dynamic? It's because the reason the evil is focused on you is because the individual is fighting God. They're fine with everybody else, and it's not that you have a problem with anyone else. It's that theirs is focused uniquely on them because God is trying to do something in their life. God is working on them to bring them to himself. Their mother is sending them books by Max Licato, okay? Their, 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 their kid is getting affected by young life, okay? They're surfing and seeing uh, old Billy Graham things on TV, crusades. And they're, they're shutting down, saying, no, they're resisting God. And in their proud rebellion that they will not let God take control of their life, they're fighting God. But it's kind of hard to fight God. You just can't quite see him to get. So they look in their environment for somebody who reminds them of God or seems to know God, and it's you. Something about your life. Something about they went by the snack room where the little tables were and the machines and They saw you take out your brown bag out of the refrigerator and pop your Coke and sit down and they saw you for about 10 seconds, just quietly thank the Lord and then shake out your sack. Or maybe when the delivery guy came by to drop off mail, some nerdy guy and everybody in the office always gave him a bad time and you were always kind to him. You always asked him how things were, knew his name and thanked him and there's something about your life. You just seem to know God. Maybe they, maybe they got some, saw something on your desk that had to do with your church activity. And maybe during your lunchtime, you were making some phone calls for a, a missions trip or something. And all of a sudden, you represent God. And so they're going to resist God by... <coughs> you 
You see this with Saul of Tarsus. Saul is supervising the execution of Stephen. Saul is on his way to the next capital with letters of extradition. He's going to find Christians, bring them back, and he's going to execute them too. He gets on the road to Damascus and a light from heaven knocks him off and a voice from heaven says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's the Christians who are dying. But the voice from heaven knows where the real issue is. Saul is a proud Pharisee. If Jesus is the Christ, then everything of value in his life is worthless. If Jesus is the Christ, his family connections, his being born within the elite structures of Jewish society don't matter. If Jesus is the Christ, his education at the finest universities isn't worth anything. If Jesus is the Christ, his entire life, which has been built on he has satisfied the law, comes crashing down. If Jesus is the Christ, everything of value in his life is worthless. And he is fighting that persecuting the church. But in his persecution, somebody turns the other cheek. As he supervises the execution of Stephen, as the <laughs> false witnesses pick up the boulders that are going to crush the skull and smash the bones of Stephen, what does Saul hear coming from the pit? Not, God will get you, you'll fry in hell for this. No. Father, do not put this sin on their account. And when the voice out of heaven knocks him to the ground on the road to Damascus, the voice says, Saul, it's hard to kick against the goads. A goad was a sharp stick pointed at one end. Farmer held it as he went behind the oxen plowing. Every so often the oxen would come to a stop and farmer would say, no, no, go on, keep going. Okay. Oxen would go, stop. Okay. After four or five times of that, the ox says to himself, next time that thing back there kicks me, I'm going to kick it right back. Stops. Okay, it's hard to kick against a sharp pointed stick saw. You're resisting me. And there in the dust, blinded by the light, Saul says, Lord, what do you want me to do? Eye for eye. Tooth for tooth. Hey, that's good for the American courts. It'll keep justice, prevent anarchy. Our society will run well. But in our private dealings with one another, though someone tries to get at us and does evil, do not resist that evil. Absorb it. And in the process, what God is doing in their life, it may be the last link which joins them to your God. Let's pray. Father, help us to recognize the difference between evil which comes uniquely focused on us and evil which is just widespread throughout a larger scale. Help us to spot it. And then, Father, give us a, an infusion of your grace at that moment because something within us will immediately start to swell up and want to snap back or retaliate or in some way uh, pay them back. Give us the grace to just absorb it and instead to respond with, if they're hungry, we feed them. We're thirsty. We do good for them. And Father, if we will be obedient to you in this, perhaps you would allow us to see the moment when they are brought to you. And perhaps even they might say something to us about that our actions were part of what God used 
to bring them to himself. We commit ourselves to working with you. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.